In the last video, we saw the method of bagging in action. Bagging helps for models with high variance and low bias. If we have the opposite, a learner with high bias and low variance, can we somehow build an ensemble to reduce that bias? This is the hypothesis boosting question. And here hypothesis is a synonym for learner or model. Is there an ensembling method that allows us to create a series of models from a family with high bias, like linear models or decision stumps, and to create an ensemble that together has low bias, possibly at the expense of a slightly higher variance? The answer is boosting. Most boosting methods work by adding a weight to each instance in the data. For each new model, we lower the weights of the points that the previous models got right, and we increase the weight of the points that the previous models got wrong. And we then train the next model to focus on this reweighted version of the data. Here's what that looks like in general. In this slide and in the rest of the video, lowercase m's refer to the individual models in our ensemble, and uppercase m's refer to the predictions of the ensemble as a whole. We start by training some base classifier m0, and we take a number of steps k, where k is a hyperparameter indicating the number of models we ultimately want in our ensemble. And at each step in this loop, we train a new model and we add it to the ensemble together with a weight. The prediction of our ensemble so far is then the weighted sum of the predictions of all the models in our ensemble. We look at the predictions of our ensemble so far, which parts of our data it gets right and which parts of our data it gets wrong. We increase the weight for the instances it gets wrong, normalizing the weights afterwards. And we then train a new model on the reweighted data. We assign it a weight based on how well it does, and we add it to the ensemble. And after k steps, mk is our final model. To instantiate this basic algorithm, we need a few ingredients. First, we need to figure out what it means to train unweighted data. If we have a loss function that consists of a sum over the data, we can just turn that sum into a weighted sum. And we've seen examples of weighted maximum likelihood loss in the lecture on density estimation. If our model isn't trained by an explicit loss function, like for instance the tree models we saw in the first two videos of this lecture, then we can simply resample the data set at each iteration of this loop and make the instances with higher weights more likely to be sampled. We can think of this as a kind of weighted bootstrapping. The second thing we need to figure out is exactly how to set these instance weights and how to set the weights of the model in our ensemble. One principled way of doing this is an algorithm called ADABoost, which is short for adaptive boosting and works for binary classifiers. We assume we have a model family of models that are individually high bias and of low performance, and that they output a numerical value, which is minus one for a negative class and plus one for a positive class. And that the target values in our data are also minus one and plus one. As before, we compute the output of the model ensemble at iteration t minus one as a weighted sum over all the models we've trained so far, since this is a weighted sum, this outputs a value between minus one and plus one, and we will take these values as fixed. So once they've been chosen, we won't backtrack to change them anymore. The only thing we can change at this point is which model MT we're going to add to the ensemble next and what weight we're going to assign it. This means that the ensemble at step T will consist of the ensemble at step T minus one, plus our new model times its weight. And what we're trying to minimize is the loss of our ensemble after we've added this new term. We first define the error, or the loss, for the ensemble step at time t, and then choose mt and at to minimize this loss. The error of a particular instance we define as the negative exponential of the target label times the model output. y times mt, if the model gets the label exactly right, is either 1 times 1 or minus 1 times minus 1. So the input to the exponential becomes minus one and the error is low. And if the model gets the classification exactly wrong, y times m is either minus one times one or one times minus one. So the input to the exponential becomes one and the error is large. We sum up all the errors over our data set 
and take that as our total error, which we want to minimize. Now we can take this per instance loss and rewrite it to separate the error caused by the ensemble so far, which we can't change anymore, and the error caused by our choice of model MT, which we can still optimize for. Taking this out of the exponential, we get two factors, one which is constant and one which we still have control over. We call the one which is constant our weight wi for that instance. So if we sum the loss per instance over all of our instances, we see that we now have a weighted loss. We can separate this by the correctly classified and the incorrectly classified instances, where we note for the correctly classified instances that yi times mt of xi becomes 1, so the loss term is e to the power of minus at, and for the incorrectly classified instances, yi times mt of xi is minus 1, which cancels out against our negative exponential, and the loss is the weight times e to the power of at. We can take these exponentials outside of the sum, which leaves us with two terms, e to the power of minus at times the total weight of the instances that were correctly classified by our model mt, and e to the power of at times the sum weight of the instances that were incorrectly classified by model mt. To simplify the notation, we introduce variables capital WC and capital WI to represent these two sums over the weights. Now remember, at this point, we are choosing our model mt to minimize the sum of these two terms, where the choice of mt affects only the values wc and wi. That means we can freely multiply by a constant, and if we multiply this quantity by e to the power of at, then the constant in front of the wc term disappears, and the constant in front of the wi term becomes e to the power of 2at. This is not the same as the quantity in the previous line, but minimizing this is the same as minimizing the quantity in the previous line. With a little bit of rewriting, we can show that this is equal to wc plus wi plus e to the power of 2at minus 1 times wi. To see how this works, try adding plus wi minus wi to the fifth line and then rearranging the terms and taking wi outside of the brackets for two of them. In this last line, we can note that all the grayed out parts are constant with respect to our choice for model mt, while the values wc and wi depend on mt, their sum together doesn't change if we change mt. So now we have something to minimize where only wi is dependent on the choice of mt. So the takeaway for this slide is that choosing mt to minimize the error et consists simply of minimizing the sum of the weights of the instances misclassified by mt. And with that, we can very simply choose our model mt. Next, we need to decide how to choose the model weight at. So we return to this formulation of our error. This time, we keep the weights fixed, and we want to minimize the value at. Here we take a more traditional approach, and we look at the derivative of our error with respect to the value at. wc and wi are constants for this derivative, so we're just left with the derivative for the negative exponential and for the exponential. The first is the negative of the negative exponential, and the second is the exponential. And if we set this equal to zero, and rewrite, we find that at works out as one half times the logarithm of the ratio between the sum weight of the correctly classified instances and the sum weight of the incorrectly classified instances. Intuitively, this formula states that the better the proportion of correct to incorrect labelings, the more model t should weigh in the ensemble. Note that the logarithm is a monotonic function, so the higher this ratio, the greater the correctly classified weight to the incorrectly classified weight, the higher this value at is. And we can see the logarithm as ensuring a kind of diminishing return of weight. Getting 11 instances correct instead of 10 has much more impact on the weight than getting 101 instances correct instead of 100.
So putting all of that together, we get this algorithm. We start with some classifier M0 to seed our ensemble. We enter a loop where we add k models to our ensemble. At each stage, the output of our ensemble so far is a weighted sum of the outputs of the models inside it. We compute weights for every instance in our data, where the weights are computed by the negative exponential of the target label multiplied by the ensemble output. Based on these weights, we choose our next model, mt, to minimize the sum of weights of incorrect classifications. And once we've chosen mt, we choose at by this formula here. After k iterations, mk is our final model. We should note that this loss function, the sum of the weights of the incorrect classifications, given a weighting of the data, has the same property as the 0, 1 loss that we dismissed in the second lecture, namely that it gives us flat regions in feature space. If we have a lot of data, or if we're not training by iterative search, this may not be a problem, but if it is, we may be better off by using a proxy loss function that uses these weights to approximate this minimization target. So that's boosting. It works to reduce bias, even if M only classifies just slightly better than chance. For instance, if we have an ensemble of decision stumps, we can still make that a very effective classifier by the use of boosting. And we've shown ADA boost in detail, but a variety of variants exist, including logit boost and brown boost. Let's try and visualize the difference between bagging and boosting. On the left, we see bagging. And since it works in parallel, every member of the ensemble will end up looking roughly the same, providing little variation. Especially if we start with underfitting classifiers like linear ones, the ensemble decision boundary won't look much different from the individual ones. In boosting, on the right, since each learner is trained in sequence based on what the previous learner did, we get much more variation, giving us a combined decision boundary that can be much more powerful than what the original decision boundaries looked like. In the final part of this video, we'll look at gradient boosting. This is a way of boosting that is useful for regression models. The idea here is that we don't reweight the dataset, but instead we look at the residuals of the ensemble so far, and then we try to train our next model to predict those. If we can keep doing this successfully, we can eventually subtract all the residuals in all of our ensemble to get a perfect prediction. Here's an illustration for a dataset with just one feature X and one target Y. We start with a model M0 that just predicts a constant value. We will minimize the squared error, so we know that in this case the optimal constant for M0 to output is the mean of the data. The next model in our ensemble M1, is a prediction of the residuals of M0. The new ensemble model, which combines M0 and M1, adds the predictions of M1 to the predictions of M0. This combined model has new residuals of its own, shown on the left, and we can train a new model M2 to predict these residuals. We add that to the ensemble, which gives us another model with even smaller residuals, and so on. Here's the algorithm in detail. We start with an ensemble model consisting of only a constant predictor, and at each iteration we compute the residuals for the current ensemble model and add a predictor for the residuals to the ensemble. Every new model added to the ensemble is added with a weight gamma, which helps us if the new model happens to fit the residuals poorly, because then we can simply set the weight lower. In contrast to ADA boost, there is no principled way to set this weight, so we simply search for a good value by optimization, or we slowly decay the weights as the ensemble grows. To see why this is called gradient boosting, imagine a model which simply stores a value wi, which is the value it will predict for instance xi. This is a kind of perfectly overfitting model, which we cannot expect to learn anything. But what we can do is look at the negative gradient of its loss and think of that as a kind of ideal direction for where we would want a more realistic model to go. If we could control all the outputs of our model for all of our instances individually, we would want to follow the negative gradient of the loss that this model gets. We can't, of course, in a realistic model changing one parameter changes multiple predictions at the same time, but ideally this is the gradient on our space of outputs that we want to approximate. And if we look at what the gradient for this model is, 
we see that by the chain rule, the gradient specific to instance i is the residual for i, if our loss function is the mean squared error. So, if we start with a particular model, and we want to adapt it to follow the negative gradient of the loss, one thing we can do is to predict its residuals and subtract those from whatever the model currently predicts. And if we do that, we are, we are approximately following the negative of this gradient. By adding the residuals to the previous model, we are performing a kind of gradient descent for models that don't support it, like regression trees. We are training a model to predict where we'd like to be after one step of gradient descent, and adding that model to our ensemble. The ensemble as a whole is following the approximate gradient. Compare this to what we saw in backpropagation. There we also work out the derivative of the loss with respect to the network output y, and we call this a local derivative in this context. We then took this derivative and backpropagated it down the network to work out derivatives for the weights, and we can think of gradient boosting as a way of accomplishing this for models where backpropagating isn't possible. Instead, we train a model to predict the effect of the gradient update step on the output space, and we bolt that model onto our original. And if we iterate this process, we get gradient boosting. The benefit of this perspective is that it allows us to generalize the idea of gradient descent to other loss functions. We can simply work out this derivative here and train the next model in our ensemble to predict it. We call this a pseudo-residual for instance i. The resulting value isn't as intuitive as a proper residual, but training the next model to predict the pseudo-residuals works just as well to minimize the loss. For instance, here's how it works for the mean absolute error, also known as the L1 loss. The absolute value of the difference between the output and the target. As we've seen before, minimizing absolute errors instead of squared errors leads to gradients composed of the sine and the median as a minimizer. Therefore, if we want to use gradient boosting to minimize the MAE loss, we should train the next model in our ensemble to predict only the sine, minus one or plus one, of the difference between the model output so far and the target label. And once we have these predictions, we add them to the current ensemble. So, we've seen two methods of boosting in detail, gradient boosting and ADA boost. Both are available in sklearn, and gradient boosting in particular is a popular choice to use in combination with regression and decision trees. In gradient boosting, we look at the residuals of the current ensemble and fit the next model in the ensemble to these. Whereas in ADA boost, we use the output of the current ensemble to reweight the dataset and train a new model on this reweighted version of this dataset. That's it for ensembles. They're a good way to give your model an extra boost in performance at the expense of a little extra computation. And they're especially popular methods to use in machine learning competitions. In the next lecture, we will look at an abstract task that is slightly different from either classification or regression. The task of matrix factorization. And this is used primarily to train machine learning systems called recommender systems.